Well, good morning, church. Good to see you. You want to just stay standing up and stretching for a little bit? Hey, we're, uh, we're glad that you're here. You can be seated. Uh, let's go to the, to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you. In the midst of such a challenging year and season, we know that the most important thing still remains true, that you are our Redeemer, that you live and you have rescued our souls. And so this morning, Lord, if there's anyone in this place or anyone joining us online or anyone days or months or even years from now um, coming across this service or this message, Lord, may our hearts know that the most important message that we need to respond to is are we willing to spend eternity separated from our Creator? Are we willing to accept the invitation to be adopted into the family to have our eternity of peace and comfort secured by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, this morning as we're gathered together, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for our fourth week in a row uh, to be able to at least attempt to be in person. And so we're grateful, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that you would turn our hearts this morning by the work of your Spirit. Where our hearts have been in a distress and despair and frustration and angst, Lord, would you turn us... Um, towards hope? Would you turn us towards anticipation? Would you turn us uh, toward um, eternity this morning? God, we need you to interact in our lives. We need to fill your spirit and your presence. And so, Lord, open our ears. Open our hearts. Lord, would you stir some old sedentary waters of the spirit that have been calm for a long time? Lord, would you stir them up in us this morning? We ask you to do this because you're the only one that can change anything. You're the only one that can change heart and transform lives. So we ask you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can grab your Bible and go to Acts chapter 13. Uh, if things go well, I'll get there uh, at some point. Uh, you know, so as we step into uh, today, I want to take some time and, and lay out a few things that the Lord really finally started galvanizing for me. Um, over the last couple of days. And so anytime there's a transition in a church, uh, anytime there's a new pastor, much less multiple staff, um, everybody's always kind of wondering, who is this guy? What does he care about? Where are we going? What are we going to do? How are we going to get from where we are to where we need to be? Um, and I'm one of those people that it takes me about 18 months to kind of settle in and get to know people. I am a relational leader. I care more about you as an individual than I care about any title you carry. And I hope you carry uh, and feel the same way about me. Um, I absolutely believe it's about loving one another as Christ has loved the church. Uh, and so mutual respect, coming together, that's why I love conversation. That's why I, I'm so for getting to know people. And I tell you what, out of 14 months, spending seven, almost eight of them away from people. Like, there is no pandemic protocol for pastors. Like, I didn't pull out the manual from seminary. One, I didn't go, but that's another story. I, I didn't, we didn't, nobody had that. When I talked to Pastor Stephen from Obuye, he didn't have one. When I talked to people locally, they didn't have one either. Um, but what I do know is that God has given us clear instructions about how to see this world and how to treat one another. And that's what we have to be about. Um, so this morning what I want to do is I want to lay out some kind of big pieces um, that we're working on and laying out. Everybody's seen that picture before of the iceberg? There's, there's the water line and there's this little chunk of the iceberg sticking up out of the water. And people go, that's an iceberg. No, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And then below the surface, there's this giant mass. Or even when you think about a, a beautiful oak tree, yes, over time you can see the beauty of it. But for a long time, that little acorn just grows roots beneath the surface. And I want to tell you this. I can tell you this with a firm confidence that God has been doing so much here at First McAllen under the surface. In the root system of where we're going. And it's been really difficult because it's been hard to communicate some of that. 
Um, and I know we have wild spectrums of like, what are we doing? And I want to lay out a few of those pieces this morning. And these pieces, I don't have them on the slides because really over the last 24 hours, they just really more and more galvanized in my soul that I go, yep, that. Yes, that. Because we live in a cookie cutter, copycat world. I could pull all kinds of information and just pretend it was my vision that the Lord gave me for this place and it would just be somebody else's vision that God gave to somebody else for some other place. But we absolutely believe that God is doing a fresh work here and will continue to do that. And as we get more and more peace and clarity on that, we'll lay that out. What I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes is going to determine whether or not I get to Acts chapter 13, okay? Um, I might get there. If we do, it's going to go fast. So be, be ready up there with the trigger, Brian. So, so here's, here's such my heart for this, that God is not finished with this place. He wasn't finished before the pandemic. He's, he's not finished in the midst of the pandemic, and there are things in front of us. So let me give you some, some pieces here uh, that are very practical for us right now. Last week, I made a statement about our first 50. First 50. We're in a sense of a, in a reset, in a, in a re-entry. Just like whenever something's coming back, a satellite's coming back from space, or a space shuttle's coming back from space, re-entry is a real tricky moment. It gets a little heated. Hello, America. <laughs> Hello, church. But it gets heated, and there's pressure, and there's tension. And if you don't go about it just the right way, it can be explosive and terrible. And so what we're trying to do is be very careful in our re-entry. At the same time, laying out some of the fresh pieces for the future. And the first 50 is part of that. To say, not so much where we've been in the past, but as we step into this new time frame... The first 50. The first 50 is something very simple. The whole concept behind it is we are called to be servants. Every follower of Jesus Christ is called to invest in the church with their life and help other people be discipled and help reach other people. So the first 50, you're going to see more about this in the days ahead, is just a real simple approach to try to get our first 50 people that say, right now I'm comfortable stepping in to help in this capacity. And as we begin looking in the first quarter of the 2021 and re-entering and regathering and adding more pieces, listen, we're going to have to have more bodies. We're going to have to have more people. We're going to have more uh, opportunities for people to serve, but it's going to be difficult. We're going to have unique challenges that we're going to face, and we have to do that with a proper mentality and mindset. Um, everything that we were doing before, it's all shifting. It's all changing because of what we're walking through. And so we want to get about Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. Um, that is, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. We want every believer in Jesus Christ to be equipped and discipled to help participate in the work of the ministry. The most important, most profound ministry this church will have in the future will not just be me standing in a pulpit. That's important. We will not move away from that method. But it's going to be each of us, life on life. You know that phrase, that, that, that scripture where two or three are gathered? Discipleship, in the little moments, in the hallways, in the classrooms, in opportunities that we have. We want to help equip people. If you're interested uh, and let, want to let us know you're interested in being a part of that first 50, we've created something on our website. We've redone the website. We're still working on it. But if you go to firstmcallen.com, there's a spot on there on the very front page. And it says, uh, serve or first 50. And there is a serve survey there. You can click that. You get a little bit of information that you share with us. And then we have a bunch of items listed. I've listed them and what I believe are going to be our highest priorities as we begin our re-entry. And so you can go to that. If you get bored in a moment of listening to me, go get it. Okay, pull your phone up and go, go, go get after it. I won't get an alert. Um, but it gives you that opportunity. Just because you say, I want to serve in that area, it does not mean you automatically serve in that area. We have certain trainings we want to do. We have certain expectations. We have responsibilities we have to cover with all of our children's ministries and student ministries. Um, but what we just want to know is like, hey, if you're interested in that, let us know. Because that has to be the backbone of this church moving forward. Discipleship and service. Second thing is first steps. 
Um, some of you, you're, you're newer faces, uh, but you've, you've been around for a while, but we've been very cautious with laying out those next steps, those first steps to take as we've tried to understand where we are as a church and what we need to lay out to be really healthy moving forward. So some of you are in this first steps. If you're new to First McAllen, um, then you, there's a Connect survey on our website. It's also the same number that you've been seeing with our text in church opportunities. Um, that gives you a basic connection. It's the old connect card, the welcome card kind of thing that's been sitting there. But it's an opportunity for us to know that you have some sort of interest. And what we want to do is build those relationships and have an opportunity. So if you're just first connecting, here's the whole point. We want to uh, just get to know you a little bit better. And we want to help you begin to get to know us. We want you to know what you're getting into. And we're still figuring some of that out. The third thing is this is next steps. This is really important. This is language we will use from here on out. First steps and next steps and then ongoing steps. The next steps, if after you've connected with us for a little while, is just if you're interested in membership. You're interested in baptism, wanting to put your faith in Jesus Christ. These are some of those next steps. And we cherish church membership. We want to make sure we have good understanding of who you are and help you have a good understanding of who we are. You ever been in situations where church membership gets sloppy and it gets chaotic and all of a sudden you realize these people don't even believe the same things? That's not okay. We, we don't want to do that. Uh, what we want to do is try to create a healthy system so that we can talk, we can communicate, we can learn so that we're ready to roll. We're ready to not use a bunch of sideways energy fighting and debating over issues that are like so core to Baptist life that they don't even need to be discussed really. And we say, no, this is what we're about. And we don't burn all this sideways energy uh, arguing and debating with one another, but that we're serving. And we're helping other people be discipled in Christ, and we're getting after it. What we believe matters. Absolutely. And we just want to make sure that people understand that. So you could take the next steps survey. These are clever names, aren't they? Real rocket surgery happening right now. Thank you for some of you that got that. But it's just an opportunity for you to share more of your story. Things like, how did you connect to the church? Okay, that's important to know. When new people begin to show up, hey, how'd you hear about us? The best ones are like, oh, my friends go here, or so-and-so invited me. You're going to get website, you're going to get social media, you're going to get all of those things. But ultimately, we want to be a people that are connecting with people in the community. How did you come to know Jesus? Isn't that a pretty important thing for someone who wants to join a church? Like that they have a personal relationship with Jesus? The answer is yes. Otherwise, we need to go back and we need to talk about what is the church. How did you come to know Jesus? What's your baptism story? Um, how, what was your previous church experience? I'm going to say this very clearly because I'm very passionate about it. I am an individual who believes in good relationships with other churches in our community. I have an, every intention of having good relationships with pastors in our area. I am not a competitive person in that way. You need to remember that when God called me here, it was out of being a director of missions. And then I worked with 50 different churches. I am for the local church. I am for local church pastors. I do not play games about these people are wrong and this is why we left. I want to know, when did God release you? How did you know God was calling you here? If there were tension points, did y'all talk? Because in the future, we're going to talk. And, and we want to talk. We want to have conversations. We want to be on the same page. We don't want to be a rebound church. You know what I'm saying? Y'all remember that whole dating phrase? These kids don't know. But this, the whole intention is to shepherd one another, to love one another, to equip each other for ministry, to help sharpen one another. I need sharpening. And for me, that comes through relationship. It comes through conversation. It comes through sharing perspective. If you want to shut me down, yell at me. Scream at me. Be angry with me. It doesn't work. It shuts me down. Because when those moments happen, I think the spirit goes, oh, I'm out. Let me just wait over here. But through genuine conversation and authenticity, it doesn't mean I don't get angry. It doesn't mean you don't have a right to get angry. But it's how we handle that and how we have those conversations. So if you're trying to figure me out, think relationship. Because when I look at you, I think relationship. Because that matters. Because I'm going to have to give an account for the way I treat people. And how I lead. 
in what I teach. The strictest judgment is, will never come from anyone within the church. It's going to be when I stand before Jesus and give an account. And pray that I'll be faithful. And that I'll listen. And I'll obey. And that we'll come together in it. And when that happens, I'm telling you, beautiful things happen within a local church. I mean, incredible things happen because it's a dying of self. See, I have to die, of, die to myself first. And you've got to do it. And we got to help other people learn. But it's not just about dying to things. It's about being revived and coming alive to things that actually matter. Have you begun to hone in on what really matters? We've been in a pandemic. What else are we going to have to experience before we understand what really matters? This should be a refining time for us. It's a heartaching, heartbreaking time. And every time I look at somebody with tears coming down their eyes because of the ache and the pain of what this world has caused, I go, we have to help them be about what matters the most. I need to lose sleep over what matters the most. We're going to set up times to be able to meet with us as pastors. This weird thing happens about perception. You hear a sermon, you watch an interaction, and you create a perception. Well, that's who that person is. And something very different might be true when we just sit down and talk. And that becomes more and more challenging as churches numerically grow. But when we create a culture as a church that we're going to have conversations, we're going to get to know one another, we're going to encourage one another, guess what we get to do? We get to be shock absorbers for each other. No, 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 no. I don't think that that's what she meant. No, 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 no. No, there's a lot going on there. Hold up a minute. Let's pump the brakes. And we begin to have genuine relationships that are not just, hey, how are you? I'm good. Oh, you look great. So you, good to see you. It becomes more depth. You can't do that with 300 people, but you can do it with two or three. If we want to reach the next generations, guess where it's going to come from? Genuine, authentic, personal interactions. Empathy is going to have to be really important because what we get in trouble for in trying to reach other people is they only know what we're against. Therefore, they feel like we're against them. Empathy is huge. Taking the time to willingly put yourself in their shoes. And what does it feel like to be them? That doesn't mean you have to agree with everything. There's a, there's a little thing called a man of peace in the scriptures. We should be a non-anxious presence in the lives of people. When they interact with us, the tension in the room should settle down, not explode. In the future, we'll still call them business meetings, but I'll always call them family meetings. Healthy family meetings. Because we're about the Lord's work and His business. Well, we got to do that as a family. And I'm not a dictator. I'm not a dictator dad. I want my kids to connect with me for the next 40 years. So I can't be their best friend, but I can be friendly. I can't give them everything that they want, but I can listen. And I can own my mistakes because someday they're going to make some pretty big ones. And I hope that they'd be willing to come to me in those moments. Relationship. Relationship. Go find Jesus in the New Testament and tell me that's not how he went about the business of the kingdom. Relationship, lifting up heads, thumping a nose every once in a while. That we would be a place that is intentional about our relationships. But do you know why that's hard? It's because we all have to slow down. We get amped up, we get frustrated with a number of things. And then we just come at things and we read into what people are doing or saying and it, it get, can be a little bit chaotic. But in our next steps, you can do that next step survey, share part of your story, we'll share more of ours. Get an opportunity to sit down with myself or Pastor Kevin or one of the other staff members just to get to know one another. And then a discipleship focus. We are going to be about these things. Abiding in and with Christ like that's going to, what does it look like for you right now to walk with Jesus? How are you doing that? What does that look like? Not judgmental. You better be doing X, Y, and Z. No, no, like what's it like for you right now? How's that relationship? Where are you spending that time? What is he talking to you about? 
And then we can come alongside you because we're in the same process. We have to be about building healthy relationships. Building healthy relationships. It takes time. It takes trust. And once we feel betrayed or we have broken relationships or we have a perception that that's happening, it's very difficult to re-engage in that. But having uncomfortable conversations is so important. If you have enough of them, you might actually get down to the point where people are actually letting you in. You remember the Wizard of Oz? There is no wizard. The curtain's pulled. I will lead as a pastor with the curtain pulled. I have no bag of tricks. I have no gimmicks. I have no plan that I can say, if you guys will just do these things, everything will be awesome. I'm just trying to stay submitted to the Lord. And, and I think we can do that together. And I believe beautiful things will happen out of that. It'll be a little messy here and there, but that's okay. Because when we step into eternity, it won't really matter that much. Abiding in Christ, building healthy relationships, and caring for our community. When's the last time people in McAllen could say, man, First Baptist cares about our community. Man, First Baptist cares about the world. I've seen that. Local and global, they call, it, they call it global. This church has such a strong heart for missions in the world, and that's awesome. I long for the day that our fingerprints are on more and more locally. And that we're just training up the next ones. We're training them up and sending them out. And it's hard to keep high school students in a Bible study on a Sunday morning because they're serving. I love that. That we would raise that up and be caring for our community. So the first 50, the first steps, the next steps, there's all real tangible ways you can get connected to that. Let us know that. We'll start setting those things up um, so that you, if you're ready for church membership, we can set that up. Listen, we believe that there are plenty of workers for the harvest. Um, we, we just are waiting for one or two at a time. And if you've been with us the last year or the last few months, just know this is a process. There's, there's a lot that's happening. I'm still getting my feet on the ground. Our fresh uh, group of staff is as well in the midst of a pandemic. So, like, listen, there's some great easy wins coming. Like, there are some great moments that are going to, they're just going to be really, really small. Like, when we can get back into the nursery, like, y'all don't understand how many little babies we have at this church right now. We might have more. Thank you, pandemic. <laughs> Not a 205, uh, 2506 dove. But that's, that's going to happen. And God is giving us a blessing of these seeds of these little ones to be able to see what we do with it. That's a gift because I remember stories of when there were no babies in there. And that's a sign of God's blessing on this place. Fourth thing is this. Um, it's this idea, you won't have heard this yet, but refresh first McAllen. Like, we are not just our buildings, but we have them. Our insurance says we have like $7 million worth of them. And these have been gifts that the Lord has done. Many of you have been involved in that. But listen, it's like anything else that needs a refreshing. I mean, we've got some of that going. Let me walk you through a little bit of this. Um, this whole idea of refresh uh, first McAllen building fund. Refresh first facilities. However you want to say it, that makes you smile. Okay. Like, we are stewards of the square footage we have. The most important thing is how we steward what happens in these spaces as we get to do things again. But part of our 2030 vision is that the entire campus would be refreshed and ready for years, years of healthy service. I mean, like, just healthy ministry. That who, whatever ministry or organization comes in and goes, wow, this, this looks great, it looks fresh, we would love to be able to do X, Y, Z out of here. That's an awesome opportunity that we have. Our immediate target right now is nursery in our preschool area. It's getting new floor, new paint, freshened up big time. Um, that's going to go into the Family Life Center. Um, that's new flooring, paint, hallway updates, classrooms being refreshed. It's going to be like a different place when we finally get to go back in there. Okay? And insurance money is helping us with a lot of that. Um, but there's going to be extra expenses because it's a, a, just a big project that we weren't anticipating we were going to jump into. 
It kick-started us a little bit, and we're going to get a lot done. But then there's also the gym. If you haven't been in there since 1979, it's kind of the same. And so we have plans. It's getting a new roof, so water will stop coming in. That's what those are for. Uh, and then we're going to redo the insulation at the top. We're going to move to some more efficient LED lighting. We're going to redo the walls. We're actually going to sand the whole floor down, make it nice and fresh. We're re reworking that whole area. And my hope and desire is, is that as we freshen up that space, we have an opportunity to do fresh ministries that reach new people. I've got ideas. I haven't told you about them. They're rolling around because I'm trying to go, Lord, is it my idea or is it your idea? And who's coming? And how are we going to do it? And what is it going to look like? And it's going to take a lot more resources than we currently have in our building fund to do that. And so there's an opportunity um, for us. So my, my hope and my heart for you as we talk about um, refreshing first is this idea that you would pray. Maybe God's provided some extra resources for you. Maybe that's 10 bucks. Maybe that's a lot bigger than that. But pray. Ask the Lord how he wants you to be involved in refreshing our facilities. And then decide how you're going to do that. And then you take that step of giving. And this gets me to my fifth non-sermon point, okay? Don't worry, I'm watching the clock. It's at 26 minutes, okay? I want to talk to you about this. And I've been intentional in not speaking a lot about this. Because I've been trying to just pray and discern and understand where we are as a church. I like assessing situations. I want to know where we're at. What do we really need? Where uh, are our focuses? And so I want to talk to you about giving at first. Don't worry. All of this that I'm talking about is all going to be uh, created and published in a way that you can get your hands on it and pay attention and learn it and regurgitate it and share it. And it's going to be a part of the DNA of who we are. Really, I want you to think about two big buckets. Eventually, I'll bring two big buckets up here and we'll get the visual. Two big buckets of how we work when it comes to giving. We have our general fund. That's our annual budget. And 10% of that, 10% of every, every dollar that comes in here goes straight back out to missions. Um, I love that. Since we've been here, we've added about forty dollars or $50,000 to that. And that's incredible. That's automatic. You're participating in missions any time that you give. And then there's the building fund, and we haven't talked about it a lot, but that's a designated fund uh, that's going to help refresh our facilities. And I've seen God take $5 at a time and multiply it and get us in a spot where we can do incredible things. The general fund has maintenance and repair budget line for our facilities, okay? So we have that built in. But at the same time, the building fund helps refresh our facilities, take those big steps that we need to take, okay? That's really important. So let me address this question. How do you invest in the kingdom through giving at First McAllen? You ever been involved in one of those moments where it just felt like, oh, that was all just about the money? This is the answer. Okay? The televangelists on TV, sow a seed. Listen, I just want to talk to you about being faithful. And I'm not going to manipulate that ever. I want to tell you this so you know me a little bit better. I will never go and research and find out who gives what. I have strictly instructed our finance manager that I do not want to know. Because if we have a biblical issue and a concern from somebody who gives $200,000 a year, I want to be faithful as a pastor to address that appropriately. If somebody's in real need, but they only give $10 a year, I don't want to decide, well, they're not really that important, so I don't have to worry about them. So I'm telling you, I don't know, unless you tell me, and that's between you and the Lord. I trust the Lord to provide the resources that He wants to be here to accomplish the task He wants to accomplish. Now, we'll help lay out some steps. Here are some important pieces. This is my heart on this. How do you invest in the kingdom here at First McAllen? Through giving. Give yourself to the Lord. I don't care how much money you give to an organization. If you don't give yourself to the Lord, it's going to be tainted in some way. Give yourself to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 8, 5. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Give yourself to the Lord. 
Second thing, give of your time, talent, and treasure. I can give you verses. Attitude matters in giving. In the time, in our talents, and our treasure. It matters. It does. If someone wants to get up here and lead us in worship, but their heart is arrogant, that's a problem. I don't care how good they sing, how well they play. That's what I care about. If somebody is a great communicator and can win the room, and can take the people wherever he wants them to go, but there's pride in his heart, that falls short. If somebody has all the funds that could ever be needed, and they're willing to give it as long as they're acknowledged, or as long as they get favored, that's tainted. Now the beautiful thing is, the Lord can use the arrogant for his purpose. The Lord can use the prideful for his purpose. The Lord can use our mixed motives for a purpose. But when we have our heart lined up in the right way, something beautiful happens. Whether it's the widow's might or millions. It's just, it's just true. It's, it's relationship, abiding with the Lord, working together. So attitude matters in our giving. And I'll tell you three words that matter to me. Give cheerfully. Give cheerfully. Listen, mamas, daddies with little ones. That's hard sometimes because you know how much diapers are? And then it all just gets wasted. There's a pun there if you pay attention. Give cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. A joy knowing what you're investing in. Give sacrificially. Romans 12, 1 talks about being a living sacrifice. That includes the dead presidents in your wallet. Your Benjamins. Okay? Okay? All the, the, including our, our resources that we have to give sacrificially of it. Now, I'm going to say this one, and this one might hurt. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus instructs us, beware. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as, you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Sometimes giving sacrificially, I mean, it just hurts because you know you can't go to Chick-fil-A even though that feels like giving to a church. Sometimes, sometimes it's just the dying of the self-promotion. Hey, did you give? I gave. And some of the games that we used to play on the junior high playground, we still play today in church. What does it look like for a church to say, we're going to be faithful to the Lord and we're going to make every intention for just not to be about us. Now, we can encourage one another and motivate one another and come alongside one another and rally around causes. That's important. But to give sacrificially, cheerfully, sacrificially, and then give consistently. Listen, we need volunteers to give of their time and talent consistently. We need the same thing as far as the funding of the church. So give consistently and here's three things we'll put this into print we'll publish it and help you have these little connectors okay give on purpose be intentional whatever you're doing be on be on purpose do it intentionally give a percentage starting with something is better than nothing okay be careful not to tie the lord's love to you to a percentage the word tithe in the scripture does mean 10 it does mean 10 percent. that's a great place to be But listen, if you're a family that can barely squeeze a half of a percent, I think the faithfulness with a half of a percent is a a great place to start. Okay? You're never going to hear from me condemnation over percentages. Because if you study the Old Testament, they were probably giving, by the time the offerings were all done, a quarter. So, let's be patient with people. Start, because something is more... Faithful than nothing. And then give progressively. Increase as the Lord provides. It's a great opportunity to get into places where we can say, hey, man, if we have one more percent, this is what we could accomplish. This is what we could give to missions. It would be a wonderful opportunity. So let me just land with this. Why? Why? 
why does this church exist? Why does this matter? Why do we need first 50? Why should we help people make their first steps and next steps? Why should we refresh these buildings? Why should we give of our time, talent, and treasure? Why? Because the scriptures point to an incredible story that God created and he had a design. He created humanity and man and woman together in their own ways in their own parts of the story sinned and it devastated God's design. And yet God didn't give up and wash his hands. He says, it's okay, I've got a redemptive plan and I'm patient. And then you can read the story of the scriptures, the scarlet thread that runs from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. That humanity had sinned and was broken and was outside of God's design, and so God did something about it, and he sent a guy named Jesus. His one and only son, who was willing to go to a sinner's cross, to be put on display, to sacrifice his life cheerfully. To lay down his life just to create the opportunity for broken people to find a way to be made whole. To be reunited with their creator. To take the brokenness of this life and to say, yeah, this life is pretty rough and pretty bad. But I can give you hope today. And better than that, I can give you a place of hope in the future. And here's what Jesus asked. Believe me. Jesus said with his own mouth, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying, believe me. Trust me. What was his main call to the disciples? Follow me. Not just proclaim me, but follow. Follow me. And so Jesus offers an invitation to all of us broken people. That if you'll come to me, your sins will be forgiven. Your eternity will be set up. And I will give you hope for today. And I will help you see that the main hope is in the future. And then we get to be a part of this redemptive plan. We get to be, as we kind of jokingly say, hope dealers. The hope that has been shared with us, we then receive and then share with others. And if we know anything, the world really feels like a hopeless place. And what the world needs most is the hope of Jesus. And so God, through the working of history and time and how things have organized, we've got an opportunity to come together as a group of people following Jesus Investing our time, our talent, and our treasure and saying, out of this address, out of this place, we want to be faithful followers of Christ and we want to help point people towards that hope. And we can do that with whatever resources he provides. But it's an opportunity to walk through this as disciples of Jesus Christ, being stewards of whatever he puts in front of us, knowing that the main point needs to stay the main point. There's hope and there's healing in Jesus Christ, and we can help people that will experience it. Let's pray. Father, we come to you um, this morning, and we're, we're, we're grateful for the, the way you work in our lives. God, we just pray, we ask that you would help us to be a, be a people that are about your, your passions, that are about what matters most to you. Lord, that we would be a people that, that won't squeeze things too tightly, but we will cling to the cross of Jesus. That you would posture us in our hearts to have open arms to care for other people that are around us. That you drive compassion and empathy deep in us. So that before we start a debate, we learn stories. And we spend time getting to know one another. And we build healthy relationships, even with people that would disagree with us. Perhaps even disagree with us about Jesus. Or that you would create a stirring in us to be intentionally abiding with Jesus. To be intentionally building healthy relationships with other people. 
And Lord, that you would use us to share just a caring love for our community, both right here at this address, in our city, in our region, in our state, in the U.S., and to the ends of the earth. Lord, would you fix our eyes on Jesus, who is our real hope. Lord, if there's anyone in this place that's ready to take those next steps of surrendering their life to Jesus Christ, or they're ready to walk through believer's baptism or lock arms with this church, Lord, you stir those conversations up and those opportunities to talk in the days ahead. Of the next few moments, Grab our attention. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. And you just take the time to respond to the way the Lord's been working in you.